गुड आफ्टरनून आई एम यस मैम यस मैम यस मैम वी विल स्टार्ट नाउ आई थिंक एक्सक्लूडिंग यू एंड माय सेल्फ इलेवन मेंबर्स आर देयर पार्टिसिपेंट सो इट्स अ गुड नंबर वेरी गुड इवनिंग वन एंड ऑल आई वेलकम ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ एमटीसी ग्लोबल ऑल ऑफ यू फॉर द वर्कशॉप ऑन राइटिंग पेपर इन पीआर रिव्यू जर्नल and uh, we are blessed to have uh, a very senior seasoned professor uh, with us and it's my pleasure to read the profile very briefly uh, just one sec <clears throat> i'll do that and uh, i'll also share the ppt because there uh, is some technical difficulties at uh, no ma'am side so i'll share the ppt in the whatsapp group so that you can refer that and in case anyone has any question please raise the question to ma'am okay just one minute okay uh, it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce today's uh, resource person uh, professor dr neeta bapurikar ma'am uh, she is currently full professor and director business management at herald park quiz graduate school of business namibia university of science and technology namibia having more than 3 decades of experience in industry consultancy training and research prior to this he was head scientific research with the ministry of higher education sultanate of oman professor strategy and entrepreneurship at triple it pune and bits india after a decade plus of abroad managerial experience in the corporate sector consultancy and training she made a lateral switch to research and academics in 2000 professor bapurikar holds doctor of science management studies usa phd SP Pune University India with MBA distinction and law honors degrees she is an external reviewer women academic accreditation authority an accredited management teacher a qualified trainer and fdp from edii a doctoral guide and board member of academic advisory committee in accredited business schools uh, thank you so much ma'am Uh, for being with us today and tomorrow uh, it's a great pleasure to have you i uh, know a very senior and uh, experienced professor because uh, that's what today what we are missing that wisdom and experience uh, that's you uh, know uh, too much of importance because we have knowledge everywhere but wisdom experience uh, you know are very rare uh, thank you ma'am uh, most welcome and, uh, and i hand over the session to you thank you so much uh, thank you professor datta for the kind words and uh, welcome to the participants and colleagues whoever are there and i have just shared the ppt on your uh, whatsapp number so you can forward it to the other group because that is where you can do um well i'm happy to be here and uh, i will be sharing it's more going to be an interactive session though there is a ppt to help you all to have questions later also tomorrow if you don't get time now now the title is very interesting it is about publishing in peer reviewed journals now before we go into the discussion of uh, publishing or uh, why publish or the need for publish or why so much of importance to research in today's world uh, we need to understand that uh, uh, today the economy has moved from manufacturing to more of service and innovation and knowledge now because it is becoming a knowledge oriented economy i'm sure many of you would be hearing this very terms industry 4.0 5.0 3.0 and all those terms now so the basic question is why publish why do anybody need to publish so the simple answer to that is we publish so that we can create knowledge we can disseminate knowledge and we can build a knowledge base now this is the reason why we need to publish now when we want to publish uh, even newspaper is called a publication isn't it many of you must be seeing that there are 
uh, newspapers around you, magazines, all kind of. So we are talking now about scholarly publications. When we are talking about peer reviewed or journals, we basically are talking about scholarly publications. OK, I just want to make a, a point for each one of you all. You all can stop any time, just raise your hand or just ask a question if you feel that you need some clarification as I'm going. If you feel me too fast, you can ask me to slow down a bit, whatever is your preference. I try to be as uh, normal speed, but sometimes we tend to go a bit fast. Um, now, what are the types of publications? Uh, usually, when we talk about scholarly publications, we are talking about books. Now, books, there are again variety. We are having authored books, edited books, textbooks, reference book, encyclopedia. Now, these are the different kind of books. Each bo each type of this uh, publication and a book has got a specific objective and a specific value. For example, an authored book uh, reflects the expertise of the author in that subject. For example, if you say strategic management authored by Grant, or if you say entrepreneurship development authored by Nita Baporikar, it talks about the expertise in that subject matter. So authored book generally reflects the expertise. Edited book re uh, reflects not only the expertise or the area of interest or area of research, but also it uh, reflects the network or the network and the collaborative research which can be brought on the same subject matter. For example, if you have an like I have published edited book on ecosystems of our entrepreneurship or knowledge based economy, wherein there are people who all over the world who are doing research on that have published, uh, contributed a chapter each. So edited book has got its own specific objective. Then we have what we call as a reference book. And reference book is something like where it won't go into the details of it won't be a syllabi base or it won't be to cover a subject in a particular flow, but it will be taking it to broad contours of that subject or that discipline. Like, for example, you can have a reference book on macroeconomics. You can have a reference book on innovations, something like that. So it's a broad contoured reference book, which will give sub in sub this thing the other references which are used and for specific information, you can go there and seek further knowledge. So when I say books, it, I'm generally referring as books, but you must remember that books, so many types classification is there in books. Then we have what is called as monographs. Now monographs are nothing but a focused title, which is the length of which is less than a book, but it is more than a chapter or a research paper. Monographs usually are experience based and many a time they could be action research based. For example, you can have a monograph on project management of setting up a SME or project management for setting up a say build operate transfer bridge. So monographs have got very limited value, uh, limited focus, but they are having vertical depth. And usually they are not more than about 75 to 80 pages. Monographs are not usually published by many publishers of repute, but still, if they find of interest, they do publish. Then we come to the most important one, which is concerning all we academic people, and that is called as research papers. Now, research papers are a classification by itself. Now, the term research papers, the word itself tells you that these papers I can also be referred to as articles, journal articles, refereed articles, refereed papers, but basically they are research based. So there is an underlying research when you publish a research paper. And that is what is commonly referred to as journal refereed publications. Then we also have newspaper articles, online articles. There are now with the internet, there are people who write blogs. Then there are people who have videos on subject matter. They are called as V-blogs. So these are the different kinds of publication. But when we talk about refereed publications, mostly and in general, we are referring to research papers. Now, 
when we talk so what are the types of papers we have now in this also we have again a classification called as white papers journal papers and peer reviewed papers now white papers are generally policy documents which are also research based but they are not published for the public at large usually white papers are papers published in the government sector where before they take a decision on any major decision like expansion diversification uh, strategic alliance or adding a new market or international market they do have internal people experts having a white paper now that it is called as a white paper because it is not published and it is meant for the consumption of those people who will be taking decision in the government but it will be equally research based and it will have certain characteristics of what we call as refereed papers the next is journal papers now journal papers are hello hello I can, I can hear somebody talking. Can I continue, please? Hello. Dr. Uma. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, yeah, ma'am. Yeah, good evening. Somebody Let's continue, ma'am, please. Yeah, can I continue? Okay. Because I heard yes, somebody. Yes, no, thank you. Me. Yeah, it's okay. So, thank we you, are not, yeah. so journal papers can be refereed papers or non refereed papers but generally when we talk about publishing in peer reviewed we are talking about refereed papers which means they have undergone a peer review process now with this background if you all have any questions in the meanwhile you can ask me now this now what is a peer reviewed publication you need to understand what makes it a peer reviewed publication a peer reviewed publication is also called as scholarly publication now excuse me ma'am yes. ma'am i'm not able to hear you because there's a lot of background noise someone else yeah. might be speaking even somebody else is speaking even i was saying the same thing but i don't know who is speaking dr uma yes, your yes. mic is on can you please switch it I on have, i have muted her ma'am okay thank yeah. you sir oh. Can I continue, please? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. So when we are talking about peer-reviewed publication, which is also referred to as scholarly publication, you must understand why do we call it a scholarly publication? It is called scholarly publication because the sources are written by academics or experts and who contribute to knowledge in a particular field, and they share findings. either they create new theories or there are analysis or in new insights or some summaries of current knowledge which will give future direction to new knowledge now scholarly resources can either be primary or secondary many a times most of us feel that okay we all want to do research but it's so difficult to do research because we don't have primary data but there is nothing that could research is based on primary data you can have excellent peer reviewed papers based on secondary data also so scholarly characteristics are not determined by the source of data but by how it is presented with what we call as critical critiquing and academic argumentation and supplementing your argumentation with proper referencing and citation so whether the data is primary or secondary is not as important as how scholarly you make your arguments which are evidence based and also having what we call as the critical argumentation or the academic argumentation now what are some of the characteristics of this scholarly articles usually a good scholarly article will have a formal appearance that means there will be a proper format so usually you will see a research paper will have an abstract it will have keywords it will have an introduction it will have a background it will have a literature review it will have research methodology and then it will have discussion then it will have findings 
then it will have implications. Then under implication, it may have types of implications like managerial implication, policy implications, theoretical implications. It will have future areas of research because there is no research without limitation. And the limitation of the previous research determines future areas of research. There will be what we call as solutions and recommendations if you are exploring a problem in research or investigating a problem in research. And of course, it will have a conclusion. It will also spell out the significance and limitations of that research. Now, this means these are all the subsections which give it a formal appearance. The discussion section, which is supposed to be the heart of the scholarly article, is supposed to be supplemented not only with theory and text, but also appropriate tables, graphs, and diagrams to make sure that the reader has a choice to understand between theory and graphs and tables. Now, many of you may not realize it, but we always, we all of us understand things differently. Some of us understand by reading text, but some of us are very good at understanding tables, diagrams, and graphs. That is called as kinetic learner versus visual learners. So learners are of different kinds. So your scholarly articles must be able to appeal to a larger base of these learners and knowledge seekers. So uh, these are some of the characteristics of scholarly articles. They must have an abstract, as I said, and they must have sections, as I explained to you. And usually these articles or papers, as they're called, are written by experts in the field. So you will not, of course, somebody can have what we call as a multidisciplinary approach and maybe writing in three or four or five areas. But still, there will be a common thread running those areas. Like, for example, it can be broadly management sciences. And then you, you may have, right, you may be writing articles on, say, strategic management, like at my area I'm talking about, for example, a strategic management, innovation, entrepreneurship, management, education, higher education, research, knowledge management. Now, these are broad areas, but there is a running thread that they all come under management sciences. You will not see me writing an article, suddenly something in physics and chemistry and biology and what. That doesn't happen. So when we talk about scholarly articles, it is an implied thing that it is by an expert or an authority in at least a broad area of discipline. So these are the characteristics of scholarly articles. Now, what are the elements of scholarly writing. So when you want to do scholarly writing, there are certain elements. The first one is the central argument. You want, there is an argument which is at the core of that research paper. So you have a central argument around which you build the whole research article. Then you are having reliable and peer reviewed sources. So you are not going to claim that you know everything or everything is from your head without referencing the previous work done by the previous experts in different fields. You cannot have a scholarly writing. That's why it's rightly said, you stand on the shoulders of the giant so that you can see far ahead. Research is about building on what exists. That's why the word research, it is search and search and research. So whatever has been done, you revisit it to get newer insight. So reliable and peer-reviewed sources is essential. And the tone and the language has to be very clear and formal. It cannot be a lingo which is very what we call a junk language or what we call as non-formal uh, language. Or it has to be in what we call as academic writing. So when we talk about clear and formal tone, it cannot be a business language. It has to be an academic writing, which means there is a lot of importance given to grammar, sentence construction, then the passive voice, active voice. How do you put your arguments? Are they in a logical flow? Is there a flow and the readability? And how consistent is your format and citations? So when you are Having this scholarly writing, you need to focus on academic writing. That means your format, 
must be consistent. Your language must be consistent. The way you cite. Citations are also, like for example, there are different ways of citing. Uh, most commonly in management sciences, we use APA, but there are other, ML, Harvard, etc. So you have to be familiar with how you are citing. And you can't change citation in one paper. And generally, when you are going to do uh, refereed publications, usually the journal to whom you submit your paper, they tell you what kind of um, uh, referencing they need. Because their journals, journals, they are very specific about how they want the referencing to be done. Now, once we do this, when what, when we say it's a peer-reviewed paper, obviously uh, there is a peer review process. So you all must understand what is the peer review process. Peer review process subjects scholarly work, research, or ideas to scrutiny of others who are experts in the same field and is considered necessary to ensure academic scientific quality. Now, peer review is called as a referee process. So what happens is when you want to do a publication in a referee journal, your article or whatever manuscript you prepare has to be peer reviewed. Peer reviewed means that your work will be scrutinized by other experts in the area to see whether it meets the standards required of a refereed publication. So generally, all journals have got their editorial board and they ask subject experts to review this submitted articles. And they have a template for it. It's very scientific. There is no hanky-panky about it. So they are logically done. And before accepting, they make sure that the review process is done. And the review reports or the review evaluations are sent to the submitted authors. And if there are changes required, revisions permitted, you need to address those review comments and do those revisions. So this becomes like what we call as a solid testing of how strong is your research paper, the central argument, the tone, the subject matter, the implication, the citations. So all these things get checked there. Then these submissions are evaluated using criteria. Like usually a peer-reviewed article goes through the criteria of is there something new? Is there novelty in that article or is it the same old trash? garbage, like you have collected some papers and rewritten it. What is the significance of the research or the ideas in it? And how does it stand the test of excellence when it comes to academic writing? So this is what a peer review process is. Now, what are the steps in the peer review process? It's important to know these things if you want to get into this field of publishing in peer reviewed journals. Uh, first is you submit the paper. The corresponding or submitting author submits the paper because the paper can be a joint paper or an individual paper or one or more co-authors. So whomever decides among it, that is known as a corresponding author. So the corresponding author submits the paper. It goes to what is called as an editorial office assessment. Appraisal is done by the editor-in-chief. Then this SI is assigned to an associate editor. The associate editor invites reviewers because they do have a database of reviewers of area-wise, subject-wise. And then the reviewers either accept to review or reject to review. Once they accept to review, the review is conducted and there is a template of how the reviewer report gives the report. Once the review reports are given, the journal evaluates the reviews. Generally, these reviews have got what we call as a broadly non-publishable Publishable, publishable with minor revisions, or publishable with major revisions. So these are the four broad, what we call as grades. So if it is not publishable, that means the manuscript has been rejected at the first go. If it is publishable with minor revisions or major revisions, then the authors get a chance to revise by addressing all the reviewer comments. Now, generally, if it is minor comments, it is usually you can say that there are 50% chances the paper will be accepted because minor revisions generally mean 
either referencing or grammar or flow or diagrams clarity etc major revisions means there is some major problem with the manuscript either the method is not matching the topic of study or there is no flow or the discussion is incomplete or the discussion is doesn't have any novelty etc so it means there is a need to do more research there and if it is publishable as it is wonderful congratulations but that really happens even a very seasoned public uh, uh, expert still does get some minor comments to be addressed so once this is done the journal editor or the editor in chief informs the uh, author what is to be done so this is what is the steps in the peer review process now these are generally the questions people ask about peer review i have done this for discussion but if there's some other questions in your mind also we'll take them at the end of this peeping so generally the questions are how difficult is it to publish a peer reviewed article publishing a research paper can vary in difficulty it based on several factors including the field of study the specific journal the quality of research and the individual researcher's experience some journals are very strict they are very focused like getting a paper in say academy of management sciences of harvard business review or say nature is difficult because they have got very clear very simple very strict focus then field of study is also another thing like for example sometimes it is easy to get papers which are market oriented like marketing hr papers rather than papers in strategy innovation or accounts and finance because you need what we called as field study then again the individual researchers experience and the quality of research of course so if the research doesn't have any what we call as contribution to knowledge or the novelty in knowledge then again there is a problem in it. so the next question usually is how long does it take for a journal to be peer reviewed how long is the wait how long does the peer review take short answer it takes minimum 3 months and maximum 12 months studies have shown that peer review typically takes 18 to 16 weeks but again here there are a lot of variables some of the journals receive lot of papers so they do take the turnaround time as we say from the time you submit till the paper actually sees the light of the day can be between 1 and 1/2 year to 2 years because the process itself takes long because there are more people aspiring to get those papers in those publications for example some of the emerald journals of management sciences they take between 1 and 1/2 to 2 years in the science takes 1 and 1/2 year to nearly 2 years but then these are journals which are what we call in q1 q2 so with high index corpus index etc etc so there is a lot of these aspects one needs to understand as you enter the publishing field so you must aim properly and you must see that your study will hold for 2 years if you want these pay things papers to be published in such journals because if your study is something which is of a quick kind then if you submit it to such journals by the time it gets published it may be outdated so you have to be careful about what kind of papers you will submit to it so that's a study by itself now what is the difference between a journal and a peer reviewed journal now some of the journals like you have some of the universities also publish they have journals they are not peer reviewed in that sense though there is a review process it's an internal process so they require approval of the editorial board and in that sense they don't have a strict peer approval process can a paper be rejected after peer review yes it's very common and usually 21% of the papers are desk rejected that is right at the beginning when you submit because either they are not as per the theme or they don't meet the requirements or it is out of area or the manuscript is not in the template required etc but 40% of them are rejected after peer review which means that the quality of the research was questionable now is peer review good or bad now there are arguments in academics on both sides 
uh, some people feel that peer review is good. Some say, no, it uh, demor demoralizes researchers because many times you get castigated and you get very harsh comments. So people lose their interest to do research, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. However, peer review plays a central role in contemporary academic life. It is at the critical juncture where scientific work is accepted for publication. This is particularly clear when the results of scientific work are to be communicated to non-scientists. So when anybody in the global field want to accept it as a knowledge, then this peer review is essential. The negative effects of peer review are it can create confusion. People sometimes get clashing feedback. So generally, a paper is reviewed by three people. So what happens sometimes is each one is seeing the paper from his or own perspective. And many a times, Methodology also creates its problem. For example, if a person is a strong advocator of quantitative methods and the paper has got a qualitative method, then there can be a problem in the way it is reviewed. Similarly, if a person is from qualitative approach and it is reviewed from a quantitative person, it can have its own problems. So there are a couple of examples where they need to improve on communicating the peer review. So peer review per se is not bad, but how it is communicated and whether the peer review communication can be done in a positive way, giving scope and suggestions for improving rather than chastising or critiquing only without giving suggestion on how to improve the paper may create a problem for the young people who are entering the field of publications. Now, how do you so this is a checklist for publishing in peer-reviewed journal. They are provided a checklist. First thing is, do not be in a hurry. Do not rush in submitting your article for publication. Prepare a publication. Prepare an article and keep it. Don't be in a hurry. Then select an appropriate publication outlet. Your journal finders. Most of the good publishers like In the Science, Emerald, Willy, Taylor, Francis, IJ, they have what they call as index words or keyword journal finder so you can use your journal keywords the manuscript keywords to see which journal is most suitable once you have identified two three journals please read the aims and scope of the journal to see how well it suits your paper or how well you are at it then make a good impression with your title and abstract Many times the contents are good, but the title is so badly or the manuscript is so badly titled that it gets rejected in the first go. So spend time. Like, for example, I always say, you will pick up a book to read which has a good title, isn't it? Because you don't have time to read the contents and decide to buy a book. You see the title and decide whether to buy the book or not. So the title must be precise, catchy, attractive and it must summarize the main theme of your article and the direction of your research then the abstract must be crafted carefully and it must give out the aim and scope method data set findings abstracts usually indicate the quality of research because in if in 150 words you can exactly say what your paper is that means you have really understood the manuscript you have written. Then ensure you do a professional editing, not just proofreading, but also the text, tables, references, how they are quoted, how they are referred, how they are numbered, etc. Make sure you submit the cover letter with the manuscript. And way later, when you get the comments, please make sure you address review comments carefully. So this is the checklist for publishing in peer-reviewed journals. Now, now, how do you organize your manuscript? So first, you prepare your figures and tables. You decide that this section will have a figure or a table and prepare that. Then write your methods. Methods is the research methodology. Then write up the results. Then write the discussion. Then finalize the results, discussion, before writing the introduction. This is because if discussion is insufficient, you cannot demonstrate the scientific significance. Then end with a clear conclusion. 
after that you go and write a compelling introduction and then the abstract now many of you will wonder though in the paper abstract is first title is first abstract is second third is introduction but in the process actually it comes later because you cannot write a good introduction unless you have completed the paper you cannot write a decent abstract without the paper ready and you cannot finalize a crisp your title till your whole paper is ready then you select proper keywords for indexing so that it gets more citations if there are acknowledgments you write up you write up proper referencing depending on what style at each review step make sure that you do your groundwork for the entire process that the groundwork which you need to do before writing your paper are that the topic to be studied should be first the issue to be solved that means you must have a problem or an idea you want to explore so you must define your hypothesis and objectives this will go into introduction and this will determine your methods and discussion and findings second the literature related to your topic must be done thoroughly you need to select about some 30 papers that can be cited as references and do a thorough reading and adopt what we call as a literature schema method wherein you make a table and say this is the paper this is the journal this is the method used these were the findings these were the limitations this were the thing so once you do literature schema you will be able to understand where is that paper of yours or your manuscript which is going to fill the gap because research is about filling a gap not about hashing the same old thing which is available so these two groundwork that is the topic you want to study or explore which means your hypothesis or the objectives must be clear and second the literature review on that topic must be done thoroughly now generally people have this question what should be the length of the manuscript it's good to adhere to the journal guidelines because usually journals do give guidelines for the author but an ideal manuscript is between 25 to 40 pages, double spaced, including essential data only. So if yours is based on primary data, you don't have to get, you don't have to give set data sets there. So the general guidelines are title should be short and informative. Not more than 13 words is what is said. Ideally 10 words title with less number of conjunctions. So a title with and of in the is very confusing avoid that as much as you can abstract less than 250 words usually 150 words with eight, seven to ten keywords introduction about two pages research methodology about two to three pages results about six to eight pages discussion about four to six pages conclusion about one paragraph figures about six to eight one per page tables one to three references 20 to 40 so about two to four pages if i were to tell you in word length a good refereed article will not be more than eight to nine thousand words wherein it will include everything of what is covered here in terms of length and words so maximum eight to nine thousand words should be a good journal article so this is what is for today at plan that what what we mean by publishing in a refereed journal article now what i am going to ask you is you can ask any of your questions you have so we can then discuss it i have covered most of the things but anything you want in detail you have any questions you can ask this is today's part one of publishing in peer-reviewed journals so with this i've completed what the ppt is which is shared to you pro by professor Dutta. now we'll have a robust question and answer interaction session i want you all to ask me as many questions as you can so that i can give you more up to date uh, what i say as the knowledge or the sharing we can do which is relevant to all of you good evening ma'am yes uh, my name is prima i'm an assistant professor at mount Carmel college bangalore uh, ma'am, I have a question. Uh, yeah. uh, 
papers related to systematic literature review or bibliometric literature review uh, yes. such research articles is there any particular journal in that we should or any any uh, you know reserved journals for such kind of publications ma'am do you uh, have any no. suggestion no actually you know all the journals good journals i mean especially uh, if you see uh, imrad or igi or indescience or really all of them except the systematic literature review and bibliometric analysis papers the only issue or the only suggestion i can give you is whenever you are doing a paper on this bibliometric analysis or a systematic literature review make sure the topic is not very current okay what happens is very times when we choose a topic which is very current then it doesn't go well with the methodology of systematic literature review or bibliometric analysis because when we talk about systematic literature review or bibliometric analysis basically it means that there is lot of research already done on that okay then only we can do a systematic literature review or what we call as bibliometric analysis like for example suppose you say i want to do bibliometric analysis on knowledge management in smes it may be not a very right topic to do but if you say you want to do bibliometric analysis on financing for smes now that's a right topic because there has been so much of literature so many studies so many reports so many state wise different people have done financing on smes so there's a lot of literature then you can do a systematic literature review and bibliometric analysis so this method is suitable for a topic which is well researched okay but if you are able to get a get it right then all the good journals accept it yes thank you so much ma'am yes ma'am i hope i could uh, I, i i hope you got uh, your uh, uh, query uh, solved to some extent because it's a topic yes, which will keep the mind whether the systematic literature review or bibliometric analysis is relevant or not what happens sometimes is when we take a very current topic and try to do it then really it won't be a bibliometric analysis it will be more like a in depth literature review which is expected for any literature research paper yeah thank you ma'am yes ma'am well, thank you yes any other questions hello ma'am uh can you elaborate yes. on uh, the different methods of uh, conducting literature review and uh, which, okay. which is suitable yeah. for different yeah. situations okay now uh, generally when we talk about literature review uh, we usually have what we call as there is actually no different methods of literature review honestly speaking literature review is that you are choosing a topic and you are going to do literature review on that topic but what you can do to make literature review effective is you identify the keywords in your title for example let us say you are you want to do a research on enhancing innovation in smes i'm just giving you an example okay so then i'll be able to discuss is that okay with you yes 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 ma'am okay suppose you want to do uh, say a, a paper on enhancing innovation in smes in karnataka let us say because you have to pick some area for study you can't say just in general now what happens is what you should do when you start your literature reviews you must first do literature review on smes in karnataka that would be one section of the literature okay then you must do on innovation in smes in india separately and innovation in smes of karnataka separate okay so now you have three parts of literature and then you must do on specifically on how to enhance innovation in general okay and then as applicable to smes so now you will see this literature components will be of four or five parts so these five parts when you integrate it that would become a comprehensive literature review but literature review that has no methods as such one is the in depth literature review wherein we are going to go based on only literature review and you are going to aim at theory building or critiquing of the existing theory the other is 
where you are doing what we call the systematic literature review wherein you are focusing on only the keywords and but your basic data is going to come from primary data okay that is field study so you are you are going to in the discussion link your findings based on your data analysis and what the literature review says so that is another kind of literature review and third is what the earlier uh, person asked about bibliometric analysis where you will go right in a span of 10 10 years and do study of a particular era like for example if you want to see sme's development then you will see uh, first plan of india second economic plan third economic plan fourth fifth sixth like that you will see plan wise sme's development now that would be a bibliometric analysis so these are the different ways of doing literature review is it clear yes yes ma'am thank you any other question? Please feel to, uh, free to ask any questions because this is something, you know, it has to be an interactive thing. Without that, you know, it's not possible because you can't cover much. There is no theory in publishing papers, you know. I just covered the basic things for today. Of course, there's some more coverage tomorrow also, but. Today, I just thought I'll just give you an idea of what it means to have a publication in a peer reviewed. What do we mean by peer reviewed? What is a scholarly publication? Why you should aspire to do scholarly publications? And how does it affect your teaching? Uh, I assume some of you are in teaching. I can see that, like you mentioned, your teaching gets enhanced uh, only when you do good research. Remember that. Otherwise, you tend to teach what is researched by others so conviction is less when you do research yourself your conviction on that subject matter becomes more you become a better teacher when you do research any other questions you'll have <coughs> ma'am uh, yeah. prima again yeah. Ma'am, uh, for publishing a paper, suppose I'm doing it for the first time. Uh, I have okay. uh, heard many sessions and they have given guidelines, I've got it. But sometimes even if I start writing a paper, I feel somewhere I am stuck. So ah. is there any tip that you can give uh, to all of us uh, that, you know, how well we can? Yes, of course, ma'am, literature review, I've gone through. But still, I feel somewhere I'm stuck and I'm unable to, you know, proceed with my writing okay see there are two ways to overcome that one is um you know it's better to begin uh, writing research work with co uh, trying to co-author either if you are lucky you have senior academic people who are willing to co-author with you so that you know wherever you are stuck they can just hold your hand and mentor you that is one possibility the second is you can co-author with your colleague so two 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 brains make a better combination than one so where one is stuck the other can help out these are two practical ways and the third most important way is self-reliance is the best thing prima according to me because what happens is many times the seniors may not have the time or they may not be willing to co-author with you and hold your hand and colleagues may also have their own you know it's not never easy to be you know do a research work together unless you establish yourself so the i would always say rely on yourself um make sure you complete a paper of about five to seven thousand words start publishing first may not be in those great high impact journals but journals any journal college journals university journals develop the habit of writing and reading and don't wait for a perfect paper because that is where many of the people make mistakes they wait to make their manuscript perfect like i always say your phd will not get you a nobel prize similarly your first paper is not going to go into great journal okay it's going to take time but that pleasure of publishing it will give you a lot of motivation so make sure that whatever paper you have you can send it to a decent journal get the review comments improve on it work on it that's the way you get into the cycle of publication if you wait for it if you wait for completing the paper best 
for it you will wait for eternity it doesn't happen like that yes ma'am thank you so much ma'am but, but i can say now that uh, if any of you all are having a paper which is half ready half stuck up or something uh, i'll ask professor bolana to share my email id you can uh, email to me and we'll see how it can be work how you can work on it to, to complete your paper okay yeah sure ma'am sure okay. one last question from my end ma'am uh, okay. does case study publication has a greater scope ma'am uh, case studies uh case studies is also a method of research okay so it comes under qualitative research and case study is um, is and it comes under epistemology of what we call as pragmatic research so nothing like that it has more uh, a pro, more uh, value or less value or it is easy or not easy uh, in fact one of the difficulties of case study publication is you need to get a formal written consent from the organization so that can be tricky but uh, case studies based on secondary data may be a bit easy but then those case studies tend to be more in the area of accounts and finance where you have secondary data published accounting records and all that other case study publication actual case studies from industry are a bit tricky because you need to get the formal uh, what we call as letter uh, what they call as a letter of uh, assignment you know like the industry does not have problem in sharing the data etc so but if you do get that letter then case study publication is good because some of the journals are focusing on case studies okay ma'am yeah thank you ma'am so some some journals are there some books also they say specifically case studies they want to publish only case studies so you do have a scope there but the issue sometimes is of getting the what we call letter of uh, assignment from the companies and if you can develop a case study based on secondary data then it's a different story altogether but case studies have got their own value in management education and uh, sometimes you can publish as a teaching case also where the standards are not as strict as what we uh, what we call as when we talk about case studies in general okay for example the icfa are journals which are publishing case studies for teaching purpose okay okay ma'am you could consider okay, those journals you could consider those journals yes ma'am yes ma'am and ma'am uh, could you please uh, uh, maybe probably tomorrow uh, if yeah. you know any journals can you share the list of journals with us ma'am okay. the best ones I, I, okay i may i may not have the list of journals but what i'll try to do is i'll share the link which gives you the list of journals okay yes ma'am yes ma'am oh. yeah thank you ma'am oh but another easy way i'll tell you okay that tomorrow i'll share the link if possible the another easy way is you just uh, note down these four publishers okay tomorrow i'll mention those publishers okay with their websites inda science emerald igi uh, taylor and francis okay these are four or five international visit of course india also we have like that you know you go to their website and they will give you a list of journals for example publishingindia.com they have got about 12 or 14 journals okay they are good journals in india and they are recognized by ugc and all that and plus uh, one good thing about publishing india journals is they don't even charge you publication fees okay because nowadays because of open access many of these journals are charging what we call as article processing charges and international journals are very expensive so again there is a cost aspect also like for example most of this international journals they charge something like 1500 us dollars 2000 us dollars per article i think that's too much for any indian to uh, invest for publishing a paper isn't it it's big money unless uh, universities or colleges fund and i don't think that kind of funding is available anywhere in the world forget india also, isn't it so it becomes very difficult but what you can do is there are journals which are uh, not open access they are journals which are called as standard publications where there are no publication fees and those journals are listed in emerald in the science and the taylor francis and publishing.india so just go to their website and see the list of journals they spell out their areas you can put a keyword and search which suits your area etc okay 
Okay. And I just wanted to say something to all of you all. Uh, the difficulty in publishing in refereed journals is not also of the uh, quality of research you do, quality of the paper you write, and other things. There's a lot of administrative work one has to do. There's a lot of research you have to do before publishing. That is, where to publish, Okay, how to submit the manuscript. These are all very tricky and difficult things. And the earlier you get into it, the faster you learn this. If you delay into getting into this, then uh, it is difficult to get into the publishing trap. And uh, let me share my experience with you all for whatever it is worth to all of you all. Um, 2010, I decided that I'm going to look, make sure that I'm going to do good publications in international refereed journals. And initially, I could not even do more than three publications, or I could not submit more than three manuscripts in a year. It took me so long to get the hang of it, getting the manuscript done properly, searching the journal, submitting it, waiting for the review of comments, etc., etc., etc. So 2012, when I started, it was three per year. By about 2015, 2017, within four years, I could reach about 12 publications per year. So it's literally one refereed paper per month. Now, that's a very high output rate for a research. Usually, the global standard is three, four per year. And in India, it is two per year, two refereed papers. But once you get into it, you understand it. It's like cycling. Initially, you pedal slowly. But once you get the grip of the cycle, you can pedal fast, isn't it? So it's research is like that. You need to sit on the cycle and start pedaling. Without that, it is, if you don't sit and if you don't start pedaling, it will always be a bit scared. And trust me, you have to be willing to take rejection. Even today, with so much of publications, I mean, I have about 400 plus refereed papers and 40 books published. You can check on the website my name. But even today, when I submit a manuscript, there is 20-30% chance that it can be rejected. 20% chance that it can still be rejected not because it is not good sometimes what happens is i as a researcher may be having a particular focus and the journal at that issue at that time may not be interested in that particular uh, you know that uh, topic or that area or that focus so sometimes there is a mismatch so that can also be the reason for rejection so never take rejection personally you know, in publication, never take rejection first. What happens is most of us are very sensitive about our work uh, because we have put in a lot of hard work. So when we uh, do a paper, we have put in a lot of hard work. So if when somebody gives a negative comment or rejects it, we take it to the heart. That's not how a researcher can survive. You must take it to the head and work on it again and resubmit it. Research is not to be done by heart, OK? Research is a function of brain. So you must take whatever comments or criticism or rejection to the brain level and rework on it. That's the only way. I know it is not so easy. Sometimes it is difficult because some of the reviewers can be nasty. They are nasty. But then that's all a part of the academic or research fraternity, isn't it? Okay, let me give you all an exercise which I'm planning to. Each one of you, I don't know how many are here on the system. I can see about 10 of you all. Each one of you, I'm going to give you all 10 minutes. It's a quick, short, small exercise. Just to, I want to uh, suggest to you all, this will bring out a lot of things. Each one of you, think of one title on which you want to publish a paper. Okay, take 10 minutes time. Think of one title, okay? And then you will start telling me the title here. And I will tell you how that title can be refined so that it can be, it stands a chance of publication. So how to title a refereed paper? That's the exercise we are doing now. Is that okay? Hello? Yes, ma'am. Uh, can all hear me? To all those who are on the system, the exercise is think of one 
title or a topic you want to do research okay a title and then you will mention your title and i will further refine it to tell you how that title can be uh, suitable for a publication take five minutes time or 10 minutes time and this exercise is how to make sure that your title is appropriate for refereed publication okay that's the exercise I can see 17 people are participating. So at least I expect about 10 to 12 titles, assuming that some are there, some are not there. Yes, Uttara Agale, you're raising your hand. Any question? OK. OK, start the typing there. OK, that's a good idea. Uh -huh. you can Typing. I could. I have opened the chat box. Okay, ma'am. Actually, uh, the uh, means I am thinking about the topic of efficacy of homeopathic medicine in the management ah. of anemia in the okay. age group of eighteen to forty-nine years. A okay. single arm prospective non-controlled experimental study. So. Okay. Type, type, type the title. Too long. Uh, too long. It's a paragraph. You are telling me the abstract. <laughs> okay, okay. So, ma'am, means, uh, means actually, na, uh, when when we design the title, they say it should be precise. It should contain study population, and it should also contain the study design. So, means likewise, no, 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 no. Uh, and no, 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 no. The title should need not have the study design or anything of that sort. Okay, that all is in the abstract okay. and methods. Uh, okay, uh, okay. You just type what you want to do. Like somebody, can, Kenneth has typed role of parenting on the all round development of the child. Uh, this is my topic, ma'am. He says, Okay, I want to see some more titles, then we'll discuss each type. Okay, I think. Kenneth has typed in. That's the way you can put in your titles here. Okay. Yes, yeah, I'm seeing the next topic coming from Sheetal Bura. Okay. Impact of workload on employee. Prema. Yeah, just type here, but then I will take each title and we will have a small exercise. Okay. Very good, Indira. Yeah, there are about four topics now, about five topics have come. Some more. Okay. Okay, we have got about I've got here about five seven topics. Can we start the discussion? Yes, ma'am. Uh, if there are somebody, you can keep adding. Okay, Kenneth, role of parenting on the all round development of the child. Now, role of parenting is fine. Okay, that part of the title is okay. When you say all round development, what do you mean by that? Because an all round development becomes too broad an area. 
okay and you are saying child how do you define a child child is what age are you talking about 0 to 5 or 0 to 10 or 1 to 7 or 3 to 10 so that clarity has to come okay so role parenting is okay uh, instead of all round if you can say overall development or holistic development then holistic development is defined okay but all round development is not defined so what the, what phrases you use in the title will decide then your uh, the thing and child you have to specify the age there so you can say the you know uh, when we talk about child we are talking about i think small children which means between two to nine then we are talking about school children which means between five to 15 then we talk about teens so that that clarity has to come the child has to be spelled out okay now then that will be a clear title so if you send a title like this or if you develop a paper like this then the holes in this from the reviewers would be regarding what do you mean by all-round development what do you mean by choice so that part has to be clarified okay or you have to use better clearer defined uh, terms like as i said all-round development holistic that would be Namaste, yes kenneth myself calvin yeah calvin yeah calvin yeah child means uh below the age of 12 ma'am above the age of five okay that means you are talking about school child school child yeah, yeah ma'am. okay then it it is better to say uh school child or school going children that is the phrase there because child can be interpreted in different ways by different people isn't it yes ma'am okay, okay ma'am ah. and instead of all round development you can say holistic development which you mean both physical and mental isn't it both yeah, both physical and mental both yeah so holistic development of school going children sure ma'am so if you title it as role of parenting for school, holistic development of school going children okay in yeah, karnataka or in kendriya vidyale or in public schools it will make more sense then you are telling also the uh, scope of your research because if you say uh, as, uh, children which children school going children which schools will be the question so you will have to direct that saying school going children of say kendriya vidyalaya or public schools or say in karnataka then you can have your population and your sample and your study methods clarified is that clear yes ma'am got it got got ma'am okay. okay now next is neuro marketing and buying behavior of consumers or psychological effect Sheetal, and now look, look at this. Now, if you title like this, this title is very vague. Okay. Now, what is that you want to study? You want to study uh, buying behavior of consumers. Okay. And you are having a hypothesis that the buying behavior is an outcome or buying behavior. Uh, how is psychological effect? Where do you want to bring the psychological effect part of it? Shital, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I'm just trying to make an understanding wherein the neuromarketing effect through eyes and uh, through your social media platform, how it starts affecting the buying behavior of consumers and how I just want to put an output, the psychological effect of it that in spite you are nowhere uh, keen on buying that product, but still you buy the products, maybe for gifting, maybe just for to have the product. Okay. 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 Uh, uh. Okay, you are talking about basically how this social media marketing or social platform marketing, that is the neuro marketing, is uh, creating psychological pressure and influencing buying behavior of consumers, right? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Did I get you right? Did, did yes, I get you? 
okay now you are having two topics here actually you cannot do this two combined topic unless you want to do a phd study okay if you are doing it for a paper this is too broad a coverage okay then you will not be able to do justice to a paper so what you must do is you must do either two papers you must do influence of neuromarketing on buying behavior of consumers one paper okay Hello, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, I'm, I'm listening and putting down. Okay. okay, so it can be influence of neuromarketing on buying behavior of consumers. Okay, uh, 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 consumers in, say, for example, in a particular area in Karnataka, in Bangalore, whatever you want to say. Okay, uh, that's one area. The other study you can do, which will have the psycho psychological aspects is you will have to say um, um uh, what is that exploring exploring the psychological exploring the psychological effect of neuromarketing on consumer behaviors okay ma'am ah, because you are trying to bring in three four variables in one paper it doesn't yes, work sir. like that you can't okay. have more than two variables at the most you can have three variables but one will have to be seen as a mediating variable then okay but okay, here you are having uh, neuromarketing buying behavior consumer and psychological effect there are four variables literally so yes, it is very difficult to have that as a one paper you can have okay. two separate papers or if you want to do one paper you can say influence of neuromarketing on consumer behavior uh, with psychology as a mediating variable but that would become a complex uh, research topic for phd level studies okay so if you want to publish papers and see how much that effect will be there you can have two separate papers as i suggest so, yeah ma'am okay yeah. uh, thank you uh, thank you ma'am that's why i said we'll have this exercise because talk instead of talking in the air now as i'm discussing now when i discuss uh can it's also you got some idea now when i discuss yours everybody will get an idea now we are going to prima's topic she is saying thank impact you, of workload on employee engagement among asha workers of india uh this is okay apparently it is one of okay fine but then you say impact are you planning to do a quantitative study Prima? Uh, yes ma'am yes ma'am yes ma'am okay. so what is that you are quantifying um probably the percentage ma'am how many how many of them uh you know uh say that their work they are overloaded with the work and that is creating you know they are not uh very much engaged in the job or you know basically i'm thinking about the hypothesis ma'am uh accordingly okay. with the percentage wise i'm just trying to uh prove my hypothesis ma'am no but percentage is not necessarily means anything great quantitative study okay our understanding of quantitative study is sometimes very wrong we think that if we are able to have graphs and percentages it is quantitative no it is not like that and secondly employee engagement is more a qualitative study okay if you are okay. using, taking employee engagement then it's a qualitative study if you are looking at workload it can be a quantitative study okay so your focus is on workload or employee engagement um ma'am basically it is both only no ma'am because uh from the workload i am defining whether they are engaged or not uh workload is only one or very small factor of employee engagement employee engagement yes. is a very big uh topic employee engagement is an outcome of morale uh, working conditions uh, motivation levels leadership uh, growth opportunities succession planning so employee engagement is dependent on this so many other factors okay which are all qualitative in nature while as workload is directly linked to number of hours a person can work efficiently and for the salary he or she gets so that's a very 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 what i would say very very superficial quantitative study workload studies 
Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so, if you want to study employee engagement, then workload is not the correct criteria. Okay. If you want to understand, basically, let me get you correctly. Do you want hmm. to study your basic uh, exploring how much are ASHA workers engaged in their job? Or does ASHA workers, that scheme, whatever that is there in India, does it give that employee a satisfaction to engage and deliver well? That is what is your interest? Yes, ma'am, exactly. Or you want to find out whether this ASHA workers' workload is uh, correct or more or less. Do you want to focus on workload part of it? Uh, basically, both are right, ma'am. What I was thinking in these two objectives, keeping them as objective, I can, uh, you know, uh, write two different papers. Uh, two papers you can write, but then don't bring workload and employee engagement on the same platform because one is a very oh. qualitative thing because you will have to do it based on qualitative research methods wherein you will have to pull out themes and get into stuck interview and that kind of a thing. And one, the workload part of it can be very quantitative studies by primary data collection is how many hours they are supposed to work, how many works they do, how many uh, patients they are supposed to treat and how many patients they actually deal. That is the kind of statistical analysis you can do. So workload part of it, you can do a separate study and employee engagement part of it, you can do a separate study. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I'll, so, I'll do in that way itself, ma'am. So I would suggest uh, if you want to study employee engagement among ASHA workers, what you can study is uh, uh, how does the working conditions, the, the working conditions of ASHA employer workers, uh, does it promote employee engagement? Because their working conditions are not very good. Isn't it? Like, when is an employee more engaged? Employee is more engaged when the working conditions are good, isn't it? They are a positive, isn't it? If the working exactly. conditions are not good, you can't expect the employee to be engaged. Engaged means what? Having the heart and mind in the work, isn't it? That's what is meant by employee engagement, isn't it? That the employee yes, is yes. able to engage. So, uh, ASHA workers, uh, working conditions, uh, you can do a study of how working conditions of asha workers can be improved to enhance their engagement that is the kind of study which may be useful also actually sure ma'am i will i will uh, take this ma'am uh, take that and you want to do of load impact of workload then you just say impact of workload on uh, this thing motivation levels of asha workers if asha workers are motivated or not because is the workload making them uh, demotivate because a heavy workload can make a person demotivate. So you are mixing two different kind of variables. You have to separate out those. You can study workload and motivation. Okay. Or workload and job satisfaction. These are all quantitative, quantifiable things. But employee engagement is a qualitative term. Yeah, ma'am, but this topic can be suitable for PhD, no, ma'am, in a large, uh, yes. uh, you know. Yes, yes. In a, for a but PhD, you can you use mixed methods and then you can adopt both quantitative and qualitative and you do it. For a PhD, it's okay. But studying on ASHA workers of India, will you cover whole India? Uh, right no. now, I'm thinking that's the, you know, ma'am, south part of uh, India, ma'am, south Karnataka, I mean to say south Karnataka. Now, because you asked, uh, I just typed something, no, no, <laughs> but I'm only south saying, Karnataka. Then why don't uh. you choose a better topic for PhD? This is not a, I mean, I don't think this has got some, you know, honestly, it doesn't add to any new knowledge creation for a PhD. See, uh, tomorrow we will discuss, but today I'm just saying since the question, a PhD topic must be, you know, novel and path breaking and it must create future knowledge that is very important
uh mom i was just thinking at the same time it can also give a solution to the problems that a particular community or the work class that is facing no ma'am that no, can also be possible solve, yeah it can but problem solving is not the purpose of phd okay that problem solving approach is the purpose of consultancy okay okay so if you are doing it if you are doing it as a project or if you are doing it as a uh, sort of consultancy then fine but if you are thinking of a phd topic it must be really you know more futurist yes ma'am sure ma'am like for example i'll tell you i mean i'll go on it on that direction if you want to think on this similar lines on a phd topic it must be on employee engagement for uh social enterprises asha workers this is a social enterprise basically okay okay now how is employee engagement important in social enterprises to meet the social objectives like for example does it include women empowerment does it include inclusion does it include socio economic development you know you have to raise the level of topic in phd you can't just do it at a mickey mouse level are you getting what i'm trying to say yes ma'am yes ma'am so if it is a phd then you will have to raise this topic to the phd level if it is a for a paper it's okay because see uh, you can roughly say about 50 re re refereed papers 50 refereed papers published is equal to one phd work okay that much is the level difference which you should keep in mind yes ma'am thank you so much ma'am no, really PhD, it is like uh, you know, enlightenment yeah, yeah no phd topic cannot be very say one of the criticisms you will hear i'm sorry to say this that most of the phd's of indian universities don't make an impact but the because the phd topics are very very at the base level we need to make sure that the phd topics which the students choose are really solid uh, grounded on theory and futuristic for new knowledge creation that is very important so yes, as a student for phd you all should now strive so because what happens many times the phd supervisors see they are supervising 7 8 10 they want to make life easy so they'll say just some simple topic or just complete it like but that doesn't make your phd worth it you know because phd means you spend 5 years on it 4 years on it you spend a lot of time money and energy on it isn't it and uh, it's a it's a complex degree so the topic you do must be really worth that phd you know make sure that the topic is good because whichever topic you take you are going to spend 3 4 years to do a phd is it not yes ma'am so the topic should not be at a masters level or at a honors level the the topic should be complex at a suitable for a phd level research yes ma'am i i i will work on it yeah you got the other point i'm saying okay yes, now we go to indira indira next your topic financial implications of demographic sh shift in developed economies this is a very vague topic what do you mean by demographic shift when you say developed economies which economies are you referring to and even when you say financial implications what kind of implications there is no clarity in the topic indira when you say financial implication what implications hello indira are you there if indira is not there i'll go to the next topic okay about impact of behavioral biases on stock price prediction models yeah this is a good this is a solid finance quantitative methods topic yeah you can go develop a paper on this but yes sir. but okay uh, aba but bias it is enough there is nothing called behavioral bias okay bias itself means behavior okay okay yes so it can be very simple impact of biases on stock price prediction model okay ma'am 
Okay, behavioral bias means again, it's a very tricky thing. Behavior means what kind? Economic behavior, financial behavior, social behavior, which you want to cover. Uh, the behavioral biases, as in the you know biases that uh, are there uh, as part of behavioral finance. Okay, then it is better to say uh, financial behavior biases or that way you specify. Okay. Or okay. just biases, uh, as yeah. you had said, is yeah. fine. That right? is better. Actually, it is better to say impact of uh, biases on stock market prediction models. And in the uh, scope, you can say that you will be focusing uh, focusing on financial biases. That is okay. okay. So that yes. financial behavioral part will come in the focus, in the paper part of it, in the method and in the introduction it will come, not in the title. Okay. But this can okay. be a good paper. Are you from finance background? Uh, yes, yes. Okay. And what are you teaching? Um, I I teach uh, financial accounting, cost accounting, and uh, these the subjects along with uh, financial management. Okay. Where are you teaching in Bangalore? Uh, no, I'm currently in uh, Pune. Oh, Sri Balaji and, University, Pune. Okay. And your uh, studies, you have done what? MCOM or MBA finance? Uh, I've done MBA finance. Okay, fine. Then you can do impact of biases on stock price prediction market. Okay, uh, ma'am. I'll, I'll do this. Prediction models. Okay. Prediction models. See, are you focusing on specific models? Um, not um, exactly. I'm actually uh, undergoing the literature review uh, on this. Mm -hmm. And uh, what my idea uh, was um at the beginning is that i have to look the biases affect the investors who are you know trading or investing in the market right okay. but uh usually stock price prediction models are to avoid these biases okay okay but uh whoever you know um the um coders or people who design yeah. these models they are mm. also affected by the biases themselves so mm. how how is it that these models are also not free from biases because they are also made by the same people so something like that okay. was no no the then you're mixing too many issues then you have to have two three papers to come to clarity see first okay. is you have to do have a paper on impact of biases on prediction of stock prices Okay, what okay. kind of biases affect prediction stock price? How do you predict a stock price? That there are biases which affect the prediction of stock price. Okay, so okay. those biases okay. you study. That's the first paper. Then you have to study on biases in building of these prediction models. Okay. Okay. Now these are huh. two separate papers. Okay. And huh. once you have these two papers and you have done your analysis and finding, then you can do a composite paper and say that this kind of bias will predict this kind of stock price. And this is how that prediction model is effective. Okay. Okay. So uh, now I, I think I got it. The first huh. would be just the how first, uh, yeah. stock the prices first, are affected by the biases, right? Yeah. So first is biases which affect stock price okay mm -hmm. second yes. is biases which are there as a part of this prediction models okay so you can say impact of biases on stock pricing one paper mm -hmm. okay? yes understanding yes. Uh, biases in stock price prediction models this can be second paper exploratory okay Yes. Once you do this both and you get an understanding, then you can mix and match or see this effect on that or that effect on this. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah, that's the way yes. you have to go. Okay. Yes. Uttara, Thank you, Yeah, welcome. Uttara Abdali, efficacy of homeopathic medicine in management of hemoglobin systematic levels in patients of anemia. Are a, this is like an abstract. This cannot be a title. So what do you want to mm -hmm. study? Uh, Ma'am, actually, uh, in study, we are going to give medicine to the uh, anemic patients and okay. we are going to study the level of HB. If it has been hemoglobin has been lowered, if it is increased after treatment or if it is decreased after okay. treatment, means whatever is the impact. Then, okay. okay, then your title can be just simply efficacy of homeopathic medicines in managing hemoglobin estimates 
or in managing okay. hemoglobin levels. That's all is your type. Okay. Okay, ma'am. Efficacy of homeopathic medicine in managing hemoglobin levels. That should be your study. Title. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. And then your objectives are what you are telling. Okay. That you'll manage, you'll, okay, your objective is to understand the levels okay. of patients or whatever hemoglobin or study the variation or okay. you can have, you can have a hypothesis that if this is the level, this will be the, this whatever, that kind of scientific study you can do. But yours will have to be a quantitative study. Okay. Are you planning a quantitative study? Yes, yes, it's a quantitative study. Yes, ma'am, it's a quantity. Yeah, because you will have to take readings of at least, you will have to take at least readings hmm. of 50 patients spread for a period of four hmm. months. We are going to do the reading. Yeah. 100 that, patients. That, uh -huh. are, so it is, is it needed to mention no, 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 the number of patients? I'm just overview. saying, you will have to do a quantitative study and the minimum sample will have to be 50 to 100 okay. patients. And you will have okay. to take their readings for a period of a month or so before you can come to a certain analysis, statistical analysis. Maybe you will have to use structural equation modeling or something. Actually, like yes, ma'am. Actually, it is a study. It's my ongoing PhD topic. A hundred patients are there, and I'm going to take the uh, levels. And it is uh, around uh, two years I have done uh, on oh. it. What seventy no, hundred is so good. means I was just uh, your, one referring your title to should not be more than okay. uh, it is efficacy of homeopathic medicines in managing hemoglobin levels in management of hemoglobin levels that should be good this other thing should not be there in the title okay levels of okay. anemic patients and all should not okay because hemoglobin levels itself okay. determine okay. whether a patient is anemic or not isn't it if you say it is below so much the percent is anemic. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Shweta okay. Chaudhary. Okay, ma'am. Okay. The role of leadership on employee commitment through insight of India. Uh, ma'am, uh, excuse me. Ma'am, actually, yeah. I uh, did some typing mistake in this one. I have written the topic again. Uh, if you look down. Okay. okay, uh, okay I have written okay. the topic again. Okay. Role of leadership on employee commitment through insight of Bhagavad Gita and Indian ethos. Okay. Mm. So you want to see leadership and employee commitment? Yes, ma'am. But you are having too many variables in this. Now, how will you see it? Like uh, ma'am, actually, I am a PhD scholar, so I was uh, thinking of taking it as a as a as my PhD study. Okay. No, it's a good topic, and uh, I I can suggest you a very good guide also if you are in Bangalore. Okay. Uh, ma'am, actually, I am in uh, Mathura right now. Okay, you are in Mathura. Okay. You already have a got a guide? You got a good guide? Uh, yes, ma'am. I've uh, got a guide. I'm GLA University. Which university? I'm, uh, I'm, here. I'm here. GLA University. As a full-time research scholar, I'm okay. here. Okay, okay. Then there's no problem. But your topic needs to be refined. It is not as it is acceptable because there is no creativity. See, which is a mediating variable in this? Bhagavad Gita and Indian ethos is a mediating variable or employee commitment is a Indian variable? Uh, Ma'am, Bhagavad Gita and Indian ethos are the mediating variable. Ah, through, but through them, I am going to through them. I want to study uh, the effect of uh, leadership on the employee commitment. Like uh, we, uh, I was th what I was thinking of is that uh, we follow in India here. We follow the Western or European management system, and we are trying to apply that system uh, in Indian culture. So I just okay. wanted to uh, go to a, uh, go to such a way that uh, an Indian management system can be developed, or we can. Uh, act at least apply a few our few of our ethos and the uh, knowledge we have in our culture okay then why are you saying role of leadership then why you don't say uh, uh, this thing straight away you take uh, this thing bhagavad gita as a this thing basis for leading and enhancing employee commitment okay Actually, uh, this was just a vague topic. I've just started my uh, PhD. I, it, 
only two months or uh, two or three months so it is okay. just a vague topic i need it need to be refined need that's why i put it here you need to crystallize this topic better the topic is good i'm getting the meaning what you're saying but this is not okay. the way that the topic should be because uh, if you if you are using the word indian ethos indian ethos is much bigger than only bhagavad gita okay yes ma'am so yes, ma if you are naming bhagavad gita and putting indian ethos it won't be right you can use a broader term indian ethos and uh, include bhagavad gita and other also if you want okay but okay. or it okay. can be restricted to only bhagavad gita okay you can't use bhagavad gita and indian ethos okay first thing I understand. and you cannot okay. use the phrase lower role of leadership and employee okay. commitment because this role of leadership and employee commitment these two are both phrases western phrases okay okay, okay. so here you will have to say leading okay Lead leadership okay. or leading and instead of employee okay. commitment you will have to talk about employee loyalty because loyalty is an indian term yes ma'am commitment is a western term and commitment is very commercial term. The commitment is to the extent I'm paid for it. Okay. Okay, okay ma'am. Okay. And loyalty is more than payment. Even if you am paid less, I can be loyal because of the integrity and the values one has. Okay. So if you want to do on Indian ethos, then you have to use the right phrase loyalty. Okay, ma'am. Okay. Okay. And instead of yes, the role of leadership, you have to say leading. Okay. Leading. So you right, right. Uh, so the topic can be um, leading for employees, uh, loyalty and commitment the through Indian ethos like that. Or Indian ethos okay. as a pathway to, uh, uh, as a pathway of leadership for enhancing employee commitment and loyalty. Like that it can. Yes, ma'am. Right, right. Are you getting it? Remove at yes, least the role should be removed. Role is a very uh, you know Western word, you know. Okay. Like they call it as role for many things. Even they call parents role. Like in India, we don't call it as parents role, isn't it? Parents are parents. We don't say parents play a role, isn't it? Isn't it? Right, right, right. So role is a very you know what I call as a Western word. Okay. Leading, you can say. Leading for employee uh, commitment and loyalty uh, through Indian ethos or Indian ethos as a pathway for leading employee commitment and uh, this thing. That's the way it should come. Okay. And right, right. Bhagavad Gita is a part of Indian ethos. Don't spell it out. Okay. 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 Or if you want to only study Bhagavad Gita, then it has to be very clear. Ki leadership and employee loyalty. Uh, uh, this thing, uh, critical review of Bhagavad Gita for uh, understanding leadership and employee loyalty, like that. Then you have to study only Bhagavad Gita. Okay, but okay. would that be a management topic is a bit tricky. No, you can talk to your guide on it. Are you getting what I'm saying? But better yes, to look at it as Indian ethos. Okay. Okay, ma'am. But you can discuss with your guide what I'm saying. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Anusha, okay. impact of artificial intelligence on employment and job market. Yes, this is a good topic, but uh, you will have to do quantitative studies. Okay, ma'am. Uh, but why why you want to do employment and job market? Both mean the same thing, no? What uh, is the difference? Yes, ma'am, but... Uh... Uh -huh. It's it's actually uh, it's going to impact the employment also as well as the job market also. There will be increase or decrease in the you know unemployment. So I thought I'll add both. No, because the problem with research is I'll tell you when you add this way terms, no, then that uh, clarity and setting objectives becomes difficult. So you have to be very clear. Okay, ma'am. And if you are saying impact, then you have to do quantitative. So. Uh, quantitative, then you will have to quantify employment, you will have to quantify job market, so it becomes tricky. Then you can do only one, you can do two separate papers then, impact of artificial intelligence on employment, impact of artificial intelligence on job market. Separate sure. you can do two. You can okay, do two papers separate. Okay, okay ma'am, sure. 
yes. rather than one paper because then quantifying and then their correlation and their linkages becomes difficult for you know analysis okay ma'am sure thank okay. you ma'am yeah welcome sheetal enhancing business transformation through ai powered personalized recommendation system for electronic goods Hey, it's a very complex topic, yes. Enhancing business transformation. What is this AI-powered personalized recommendation system? Ma'am, actually, when in a shopping platform, we ah. select different types of products. So, for example, I'm looking for an hairdressers and okay. that to a Philip company. Okay. The next time when I go back in searching an electronic products, it will also suggest to me the same version of product, but from the different companies itself, okay. like Sony. Or some other companies those are producing hair dryers over here. Okay. So I'm trying to study on this particular AI power personalized recognition systems over there. That's okay. my intention of study. Okay, 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 okay. And you want to say how this is enhancing business transformation? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. How? How? Okay, I got the system you want to study is okay. You are focusing on electronic goods, but where is the linkage to enhancing business transformation? It is more a marketing experience, no? Yes. Then, because so when you say, no, no. When you say business transformation, then the question is, which business is it transforming? A uh, retail business. Okay. And that on e-platform. Okay, okay. Then you will have to say, you can't use the word business transformation there. Then you will have to say, enhancing retail uh, mark, uh, marketing, through this uh, AI, whatever this thing, or enhancing retail platforms through whatever this uh, this thing. Okay, okay, ma'am. Because business transformation means a particular kind of business it is transforming. Like for example, uh, 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 real estate business, banking business, or uh, oh. marketing of products business. That is business in transformation. But here okay. you are talking about retail platforms, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yeah. ma'am. So then you better to say enhancing retail platforms through AI, enhancing electronic goods retail platforms through whatever that AI powered systems. Why you want to use such a complex word? Why can't you just say through AI powered systems? Personalized recommendation systems can be a part in your study, you know, where you explain. Yes, ma'am. So your title, see, what I'm trying to do through this exercise is, when you have discussed so many times, you all will realize it, there is a need to sort of make your titles very crisp and each term in your title must be very, very targeted. So instead okay. of saying enhancing business transformation, you can say enhancing retail uh, experience if you want. Okay. okay. Enhancing retail platform experience through AI powered systems for electronic goods okay so that means the consumer is going to have a very different kind of an experience because of this ai power so they will give you specific things as you gave an example of it can be for anything it can be for a washing machine it can be for a tv it can be anything. for an address. anything isn't it and it can also suggest you that you can look out for these different varieties of products yeah. as well into so it is enhancing your retail experience, isn't it? It is yes, making your retail uh, uh, this thing uh, fun. Fun. Uh, it is yes. enhancing your retail experience. So why yes. not say enhancing retail experience through AI uh, powered systems for electronics? Okay, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. So then it is okay. clearly, yeah. And the moment you write enhancing retail experience, then you can submit it to a good marketing paper, journal of okay. marketing management or something. Okay, ma'am. Because in this, we are trying to study two platforms. One is website of the company and one is the shopping uh, sites of the companies. Okay, that's okay. You can study both. But if okay. you put enhancing business transformation, which business then it's not going to fit into any journal because what you're studying is basically marketing, but nowhere that marketing angle is coming in there in the title, isn't it? Okay. So, I definitely will. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. So, see, Thank okay, you. to conclude, I have now, I think we had an, we 
quickly had an excess of his of about 10 12 titles of different areas in all the titles whatever was missing was the preciseness which is required so whenever you are framing a title think on the variables you want to study and don't have too many variables ideally it should be not more than two variables maximum three where one acts as a mediating variable this is the first uh, thumb rule second is your title must be able to reflect the area of study that's why i said that financial implications that person is not there but that's a very broad thing you will have to tell which financial implications what that's why when we discuss employee engagement i said no this is a very soft topic of hr so your topic the terms you use must spell out which area likely the topic is going to fall in is that clear to all of you all yes ma'am i hope this exercise yes ma'am yeah i hope this exercise was helpful yes ma'am okay yes ma'am so i think with this we can uh, stop now uh if if uh, prof uh, data is there or why is he there on the system or can we go? yes ma'am yeah <laughs> yes ma'am <laughs> okay so I thought with today with this exercise, we can stop. Yes. They have got enough food for thought. We have discussed some very good topics. And yes, I hope to see them into papers and publications soon. And like I said, tomorrow I'll share with my email ID. You can share it to them also. So that yes. if anybody yes. wants, we can work together. And uh, tomorrow we begin at the same time. I'll cover the remaining thing and we'll have some more exercises. You all also come prepared with questions what you all want to ask okay okay can we oh, say thank bye you, to each other now thank you professor Dutta, and thank yeah, you to thank the you participants man. okay bye keep okay, well man. bye Save keep Can we leave yes. the meeting, ma'am? Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Dutta. Bye. We can.